Okay, so let's get started. So as you remember, in the, my first couple of lectures, we talked about how the early stages of embryonic development are characterized by these very rapid proliferations that are all driven by maternal products in the presence of very little gene expression. And this program is sort of executed to make sure that the embryo is ready to take on morphogenesis. And what I want to do today is to discuss the challenges that are put by doing actually cell proliferation and cell division as you are actually undergoing the morphogenetic process of gastrulation. The reason why this is interesting is that if you think from a structural perspective, mitosis puts a lot of challenges on keeping the integrity, for example, of an epithelium or of essentially any tissue because as a cell undergoes mitosis, any possible thing, any possible structure, both in the cytoskeleton and nuclei, get completely rearranged. This is just a cartoon of a cell and dividing in an epithelium. And what you see is that instead of having now a cuboidal cell, these cells round up. A lot of the structure, for example, microtube will move from being around the lateral and basal membrane and they are now attached to the chromosome to pull that apart. So you really want to make sure that you make this kind of morphogenetic changes at a time that it doesn't interfere if the cells are also trying to move or to change shape. You want to be sure that this is timed correctly so that you don't run into problem. And gastrulation is a time where there's a lot of this cytoskeleton re arrangement happening. So let me show this movie again. And this is actually a movie that was taken by Art Visha, I was sitting right there. And it's one of the most beautiful movies that we actually have. That's why we lo all love to keep showing it. And uh, because it shows this, it starts from very early on, it shows the actually cortical contraction, and then it shows this really beautiful synchronized mitosis that happened on the surface. And I hope to have convinced you yesterday that these are driven by this excitable system that can generate waves. And then somehow, magically, after then done 13 division, they stopped, and we talked a little bit about how they count to 13 or how they know that they've done 13 division. And then after they've ingressed every nucleus in a membrane, they start this beautiful process of gastrulation. And I'm sure that Eric is going to tell you a lot more about this. And, but if you see now, you don't have all the cells dividing at the same time, but you get different group of cells divided at different times. So maybe I can just play this again. It's, one never gets tired to look at this movie. At least I still haven't after six, seven years seven years now. So, so this is really like a beautiful example of the synchronous mitosis, which are mainly driven again by maternal product, very little gene expression. This is maybe a little bit of gene expression, but it's actually not driving any significant cellular process. And then as soon as this then you stop dividing, you get membrane. So now this is not a whole continuum cytoplasm. Now there is membrane separating nuclei in separate cells. And then really this beautiful process of morphogenesis in which you can see the cells have been programmed to be differently. So now some cells need, they need to move in one direction, other in other, and they're programmed to divide at different time. So, no, no, that's so-called the cephalic furrow. So there is a, some cell, there is, a, there is multiple invagination, right, or tissue bending, and one of them is called the cephalic furrow. And it's the region that will eventually divide the head region from the trunk. And this is one of the earliest morphogenetic events. And uh, yeah, Eric may have a lot more to say about that. Yeah. So what's the goal of this paradox? Yeah, this can be infected. It is true. The, area, the cephalic food is a transit structure. What's its function, Eric? And so 
Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So, so you have to wait. You have to wait for Eric to 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 learn about that. So, so, but now what I instead want to talk about is how do you make sure that you don't do cell division as you are also doing these morphogenetic changes. Because if you are trying, let's say, to constrict your apices to do this in type of invagination and you divide, that is just going to destroy the tension that you need for, for having apical constriction, for example. And naively, you can think that there's two ways to do this. Either the two processes are talking to each other so that the cell knows I'm now doing a morphogenetic event that is incompatible with cell division. That event sends a signal to the cell division machinery it tells stop. And so that, the, or the other way around, that as the cell division machinery is uh, operating, can stop and delay a morphogenetic event. Another possibility is that everything is timed so accurately that cell division and morphogenesis never run into problem. And the fly embryo offer an example of both. My lab mainly work on the second aspect of how things are timed so accurately that there is never a problem. But before going into that, let me just, uh, I will want to give a very nice example, actually, from Eric's lab about um, this. But before doing that, I will remind you again of um, the cell cycle and uh, the movie you have just seen. So nuclei first proliferate inside the embryo. They come to the surface. They undergo this synchronous mitosis we talked about yesterday. They stop and they make membrane. And then they undergo gastrulation. When you can see now this group of cells is dividing, this is dividing, but there's a lot of cells that are not dividing. So now cells have been programmed to divide at the same time. From the cell cycle perspective, we talk about the fact that this early cycle, there is only DNA replication mitosis, DNA replication mitosis. They are trying to go as fast as they can. The way they introduce this extra la layer of control in which now they can program cells to divide differently is by inducing what is called a gap phase. So as soon as they've completed DNA replication, they don't enter the cell cycle right away, and they don't enter mitosis right away. They sit there, and they wait for some uh, developmental cues that is going to tell them now it's the right time to divide. And I'll show you how that developmental cue is, is, um, is actually linked to the kind of patterning that, for example, James and Thomas were talking about. And this reprogramming all happen at this transition, the meblastula transition. I talked about it in the first lecture. But just as a reminder, the meblastula transition is not only a time when you remodel the cell cycle in the way I was just telling you about. This is also the time when zygotic gene expression really picks up. And a lot of maternal mRNA, not all of them, but a large fraction of this mRNA that were unloaded in the egg to drive early development get degraded. So this is really a great example of the reorganization of the genome at the developmental transition. And probably Eric again will talk about this and the uh, regulation of the activation of zygotic gene expression in more detail. I will not, but this whole reprogramming happened at this time, and a lot of people work on it. And, um, and then after the embryo is done, this reprogramming made cells and, and undergo gastrulation. Now, actually, what you see is that uh, cells divide at different time, but they actually divide at different time in a spatially coherent manner. What I mean by that is that there are group of cells that are programmed to divide about the same time. There is 25 of these groups, and they are called uh, mitotic domains. And uh, they are extremely reproducible. It, they really show the level of precision and, repro and accuracy and, and reproducibility with which the embryo can be regulated, which the cell cycle can be regulated. And I'll get back to that in a second. And now the, first, the last reminder for this lecture from the previous one is about the cell cycle machinery. And you remember, hopefully, from both lectures that Really, the master regulator of the cell cycle is a kinase, an enzyme that is called CDK1, and which needs a partner. So when cycling and CDK1 are together, they can have um, a biochemical activity that can phosphorylate substrate and drive cell into mitosis. There is a lot of regulation of CDK1. The one that is, will be mostly relevant for this talk is a post-translational modification in which this complex that is present at high level can be inhibited by an enzyme called V1. It's a kinase that will put a phosphate and inhibit it. 
but then there is two phosphatases, but actually for this tall call is the one called string will be relevant. So there's a phosphatase string that will, can remove this phosphate, and there is also some feedbacks here to make this transition sharper. So what Victoria Fo and um, Bruce Edgar, when he was a postdoc in part of our lab showed, was that this is an, an extremely reproducible pro process. This is what I was telling you before. Before I showed you in the movie, when cell in mitotic domain one and two divide, but actually there is 25 of such domain. So this is just a view of a embryo which you have anterior, posterior, it's a lateral view, so you can see all the domains. But you can already appreciate from this picture how intricate that is, so there would be this group of cells that divides as domain one, this as domain two, three, and so on and so forth. And what is impressive about this program is that it's always the same, so it's always cells in domain one that divide first and then sell in domain two. And remarkably, this all very complex spatiotemporal program seems to be mainly encoded by a single gene, in the sense that uh, when, an, when cells in the embryo need to be programmed to divide, they express this gene string, and that's what drives them into the cell cycle. So somehow all this timing information is all being funneled and talking to a single and marinate so that in a way that makes the, the problem of understanding timing of the cell cycle simpler in, in a way that we just have to study this, the expression of a single gene. And this is what happens for most of the domain, but there is one notable exception, which is mitotic domain 10, which actually, and I'll show you in a second, is the first mitotic domain to express string, but it's only the 10th mitotic domain to divide. And the way that that happens is that um, there will be some extra delay, but an interesting possibility is that maybe, and th this is not fully sort out, so it's an open question, it's an interesting one, and I'm not sure if anybody is really addressing it at the moment, but the, there is a possibility that actually the cell cycle and the cytoskeleton are coupled, and there is one notable example of this that is from actually the work of my colleague and good friend at Duke, Danny Lab, and what he showed was that the binding yeast seems to have a morphogenesis checkpoint, so he has an ability to know if the actin cytoskeleton is properly patterned before cell division. What, a, uh, what this yeast does is that uh, you have what is called a mother cell, and when he wants to give rise to an, another cell and enter the cell cycle and start replicating DNA, it creates what is called the bud, and then only the bud grow while the mother cell stays the same size. And the way they does so is by polarizing all the actin and, sh and shattering all the vesicle polarly, so that only essentially is just inflating the daughter cell. And somehow, at this, um, before deciding to enter mitosis, the, the yeast cells are sensing that the cytoskeleton and the bud have the proper morphology. And only if they do, they will undergo mitosis. And they do this by talking to, to CDK1. So what is happening is that there is some sensing mechanism that acts act at the level of uh, the actin cytoskeleton that can talk to V1. And if you now remember, V1 was the inhibitor of CDK1. So what happens is that there is a checkpoint that makes sure that the shape of the cell is correct. If it is not, it activates this inhibitor of CDK1, and you cannot enter the cell cycle. Could something like that be going on in, in, um, during morphogenesis? We don't know, but there is an interesting uh, suggest, su suggestive process for this, and he has to do, and this is, again, Eric real expertise, and he will probably again talk uh, about this, and, and this, uh, this is a process, and we were already talking a little bit about this, that uh, morphogenesis is often characterized by tissue bending and by tissue making folds, the most well studied during early gastrulation is the ventral furrow. So this would be the, the mesoderm, and the way that the, the ingresses is by essentially making this furrow that will go in and this cell will internalize, and this was the other furrow, the cephalic furrow that you, that you saw before and Alessandro was asking about, but this is the, where the ventral furrow was formed, and if you take a cross section of the embryo, this is how it will look like, and you can appreciate in this view a little better what the shape and the morphology of the cell is. And um, 
this is a, now another picture from the developmental biology book of Gilbert that shows a, in a slightly more detail what this happens. These cells are programmed because certain transcription factor of patterning gene are restricted to the cells that have to become the mesoderm. They are called twisted neo. And uh, the expression of this transcription factor reprogram these cells, and so that the actomyosin contractility or myosin moves from being at the so this is oriented in a way that this is the basal side of the cell, that's the apical side. Myosin moves from the basal side to the apical sides and constricted. You have a lot of actomyosin contractility that constrict the apices, and that drives, and I'm not going to tell you much about this because you're going to hear much more thorough and better understanding on this from other speakers, but this causes the tissue to bend and, uh, and internalize. And, uh, only after the tissue has folded, the cells will start to divide. So what will happen is that the tissue first has to fold, cells have to enter, and then they undergo the cell cycle at about the same time, and I'm not sure if it's known what comes first, they undergo an epithelial to mesenchymal transition, at which point they spread around and one end up with the mesoderm being internalized. What is remarkable about this, and was shown, um, about, as was shown by Jörg Grossens when he was a postdoc with Eric about 60 years ago, is that, um, that actually if one looks at string expression, which I told you is the, the transcription factor that times the cell cycle, actually you can see that uh, this will be, so this is a lateral view, this is the dorsal side, this is the ventral side, so this will be the cells that will ingress and this cell seems to be the first one to express string. So there is a very, very high level of expression of string already as the other domain are barely starting to come up. Yet these, these cells will only be the tenth one to divide. So what you can see is that um, um, essentially these cells have a longer delay. But then what was shown by uh, Jörg was that there, this seems to be under genetic control. There is certain genes called Fruchstart and Tribals, so that if you delete them, now these cells start to dividing much earlier. So these are comparable stage. These cells are not dividing yet. These are dividing, and the way we know that these are dividing is that there is a mitotic specific marker called Phospho, called phosphohistone, and if you stain, you can see that these cells are entering mitosis, while at the similar stage they are not. And as a result of entering mitosis early, why these cells you can see have formed a furrow and have gone in, so that you have really only few left on the surface. All the cells of the mesoderm here are still on the surface, and uh, and actually, they, essentially, what is happening is that they were trying to bend the tissue, they start dividing. And that destroys the integrity, and the tissue doesn't go inside. Now, if this, the, the delay that is mediated from these genes is just an hardly encoded, is just an, an extra timer or a delay, or if this is more similar to East, a way in which cells are sensing that there, that there is some mechanical signal that should slow down the cell cycle, it's unclear. And I'm not going to talk about this because I don't have anything original to say. We are not actually focusing on that, although I still think there's an important open question that the field needs to resolve eventually. What I want to tell you about instead is how, what I think is the major way that the embryo solves the problem of making sure that mitosis and morphogenesis don't bump into each other, which is by timing everything very reproducibly and accurately. And uh, so the first experiment I actually did as I was a postdoc in Eric's lab was uh, I focused on two domains that are nicely on the surface before gastrulation has progressed further so they are easier to visualize. And I really wanted to put a number on how accurate is one cell division from one embryo to the next. So what you do there, you just develop some computational method to identify where mitotic domain one and five are. This is a little bit of a self-consistent definition in the sense that you look for a group of cells that divide about the same time and is a coherent object so that the neighbors are programmed to divide at sufficiently different time. And then you track these cells and you score when they divide and you get something like this. So you get the fraction of cells that have divided as a function of time. And you can see that all the cells in one mitotic domain divide in about 10 minutes. Mitotic domain five 
it's programmed to divide after mitotic domain one. And here you can already appreciate a high level of reproducibility in the sense that mitotic domain five always divide about five minutes after mitotic domain one in all of this, in all five of these embryos. So, so it's, it never happens that by mistake cells in domain five divide before domain one. But actually, what we really wanted to do was to get a sense of how reproducible every single cell is. For that, you have to be very careful. You can just look at this and decide that it's 10 minutes, because what is possible is that what I'm calling a mitotic domain as a group of cells that divide synchronously, maybe an oversimplification, maybe there is a structure within the domain. And this is, in fact, what we found. So what happens if you look at these domains is that um, they don't all divide at the same time. So what we did here was taking those five movies, overlapping them as best that we could, and look at the relative timing. And what you will see is that essentially there is wave-like pattern of mitosis. So these are the cells that divide first within a domain, and then the, the, the cells that are at this end or to, more toward this edge are reproducibly programmed to divide later, similarly for mitotic domain five. So what you really need to do is to take care of this um, deterministic pattern if you want, and only see how much does a cell deviate. So what you really want to do is align one embryo to the next, go at the best you can to the, down le to the level of a single cell, and say how precise was this cell from one embryo to the next. And when you do that exercise, the best that we could, we come up with something like this. Essentially, this is the deviation of how much noise there is in timing for individual cells once you have perfectly realigned them. And what you get is that this is a distribution with a standard deviation of about two minutes. This is over a cell cycle is about 90 minutes or so. So this seemed to be a very reproducible program. So where is this precision and reproducibility coming from? And I've argued before, based on what was known in the literature when we started, that these all seem to be linked to the expression of a single gene. But again, these were all based on like um, in situ expression, so, and very, very crude, like, you know, fixed materials in which it's very difficult to determine really if something is precise down to the level of two minutes. So we wanted to relook into this more quantitatively using live imaging. And the first question we try to see is that is really string transcription what encodes the timing of cell division? Or could there be another process? So to do this, what we did was, um, was the, the following experiment. We, we generated flies that had um, uh, and string and answer. So now you remember from both the, the lecture of uh, a lot of people at this point by Ken Post, Thomas Greger, and also James, that there is, uh, there is pieces of DNA that encode for the spatial temporal expression of genes. And often what you can do to, and this was, uh, I mean, I did this experiment several years ago. Sometimes it's very difficult to genetically tag genes in organisms. It's getting easier and easier, but it was very difficult at the time. So what you can do to get an idea when a gene is expressed is to get this an answer and the avid drive GFP. And when you see that GFP is expressed, you can get a sense of when that gene was activated in that particular cell. It's not perfect, but I think it, it was, at least at the time, one of the best things we could think of. And now we have better tools, actually, for this. But uh, this is the experiment that I could actually have enough data to show you. And then uh, on top of having flies pressing this construct so that we have a proxy of when string is expressed in individual cells, we also have uh, uh, expressed histone tag with RFP so that we can follow the nuclei and see when they divide, essentially. And if I play this movie, so what you will see, let me just, uh, I don't know, I can see my. OK, so what you can see here is that the outline will be blue, and it's going to turn from blue to white when I, when I detect expression and the gene turn on. One second, my, sorry, my, I, I cannot see my, my arrow anymore, so I don't know where to click. Let's see if this works. Yeah, sorry. So, why is this moving up? Oh, kind of play moving, yeah, okay. 
so I, I guess I don't have the, the movie here. So, okay. I could try to download it. I, I can maybe show it to you later. I'm sorry, I should have tested it. I don't know why it's not working. But what you would have seen is that as, the, as time goes by, this cell will express some GFP. And then about five or 10 minutes before it divides, I can show you the quantification of, uh, of this movie. So this is uh, what well now you can imagine seeing or imagine how the data will look like. But if you look at cell in mitotic domain one or five, what you see is that there is very little GFP expression as development goes on. And then at some point, the gene is turned on and GFP accumulates. That is specific, that an answer that we used specific for actually mitotic domain one, two, and five. We did not image domain two, but if you look at cells that do not belong to that domain or that they're not dividing, they don't express GFP, but you can see GFP accumulating in this mitotic domain one and five. And then at best we could, you write computational algorithm to detect when this gene is turned on, and then you correlate is the time when the gene is turned on predictive of when cell divide. And the uh, best that we could do this, the, the correlation were rather strong. So a cell that turns string on early seems to divide early. So this is sort of suggesting that maybe uh, most of the timing is encoding to string transcription. The other thing that we noticed, and it was true for both mitotic domain one and five, is that um, the, the relationship seems to be the same between, right, so, so there is a given delay between when string divide and when mitosis happens, but that delay is about the same in both domain one and five. So for us, what then, the way that we interpret that is that we could treat these as two separate problems now. There's two problems. The first problem is how do you decide when to turn on string? And then there is a second problem. It's like once the string is turned on, how does it determine when mitosis happens? And uh, my work, as a postdoc was mainly on this second step, and now in collaboration with a graduate student who just graduated with Eric, and now in my lab, one of my students that tried to tackle the first problem, which I actually think is the hardest one, is like how can you time transcription so accurately and precisely in an embryo? Of course, I'm less brave than my students, so I tackle the easy problem first and let them do the hard ones. So, what the, Eric and I decided to do is, was to analyze this question of, is string sufficient to encode the timing of mitosis, or are there other inputs? The best way we thought to do this was, let's just make a construct in which string is expressed uniformly everywhere, and let's make sure that you get that all the cells divide at the same time. That would be the prediction. If a cell was seeing uh, if cells seeing the same amount of string will divide at different time or will have different sensitivity to string, that will imply that we are missing something. There are other inputs. So the way you, we, we did this experiment, oh, I hope that these movies are here. Again. Okay. So th this is the wild type. And what you will see is, again, that they undergo one last synchronous division. And then, uh, and then you will get this different group of cells that divide at different time. And now let, let me show you what, hopefully, our, what will happen if uh, cannot play me here. Okay. Let me just find this movie one second. I'm really sorry about this.
Okay, so... Okay, so it's not projecting the best, but you should be able to see. So the, actually the first division you see is the last division, synchronous division at cycle 13. And then about at this time, the, all the nuclei or all the cells in the embryo start expressing string at the same time. And I hope you can now realize that they all the embryo divide about the same time. So now you don't have group of cells that divide at different time. So if you give all the cells in the embryo the same amount of string, they will all divide at the same time, which suggests that really there is no other inputs. And we have done more quantitative work in which we have looked at the sensitivity in different regions. You can look, do, are the anterior cell more or less sensitive than the posterior cell or the middle cells to string? And what you found is that it's not. They are really statistically, in a statistically ma as a reproducible manner, all responding and showing the same sensitivity to string expression. Mm -hmm. You, st you still see a wave, and the reason why I think you still see a wave is that the delay that was set by the previous wave. So for reason that we not fully understand, or we partly understand, but I can't say fully. So what happens is that a cell divides, and then it undergoes this uh, maternal to zygotic transition when it can start transcription. But that transcription starts about 50 minutes and we don't know if that's the transcription in part is also the, the protein is being degraded actively. But in, essentially, there is a process that will only let string accumulate about 50 minutes after the previous division. That process, of course, reflects the previous delay. So if you see that there's a wave at cycle 13, and you still have a wave at cycle 14, but that wave is not determined by string. What that tells you is just that the cells in the anterior express string a little bit earlier than the cell in the middle, and that is because, because they've divided a little earlier, that clock was a little advanced. So this wave-like mechanism that you see at cycle 14 is not the result of cell communication, it's actually just of the result of the previous wave. But the cells, they will all have the same sensitivity to string. You had a, there's a question there in Anakam. Yeah, I'll show you in a second. I should have put this next slide first. Uh, so, so as you have seen, gastrulation is a pretty complex process. Oops, let, let me just um, play this movie again. This is a good question. Why one and five? The truth is because they were easier to image. And the reason why that is is that uh, if you look now, the embryo is a, is a nicely organized array of cells or nuclei on the surface. But as they start undergoing gastrulation, you get a lot of folding and tissue moving. So the mitotic domain one is this one, and five is there. They are still very early. It will be very difficult to follow mitosis at this stage when a lot of folds are forming. More cells in between? Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the distance. Right, so, so in terms of, in term of distance, it's about, so, so let, let, let them undergo this division, and then I'll show you where they are. So mitotic domain is around here, and mitotic domain 1 is here, and mitotic domain 5 is around here. So there, is, there are probably a three, four cells apart, which at this stage will be 15 to 20 microns. So they are sufficient, and, the, and some of the cell in between don't divide. So it's very easy to determine the boundary. It's not that difficult once you've played, made few of this movie to identify which domains they are in, also because they are so reproducible and so stereotypical. But the, the reason why we chose them is not anything special about their geometries. The fact that being there among the earliest ones that divide, they are the most at the surface, and they are a little easier to image. The uh, sorry, I did, I, I, uh, oh, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, I should have put it here. So for that, you use a trick, which uh, it's called the Galfour UAS system. So the way this works is that you use this idea 
of an answer. So GAL4 is a transcription factor that flies down express, fly down F. This comes from East. And you remember I told you that um, when the mother lays an egg, it lays a lot of mRNA in the egg. But usually it is mRNA, with some notable exception of the one that may gradient. Most of the other mRNA are uniform everywhere. So what, that, what will happen if you have a mother that expresses maternal, what is called maternal GAL4, as it lays the eggs, it puts a lot of mRNA and protein already. So now you have GAL4 protein everywhere. Then what you do is that you cross this fly to a male that, has a, that is able as essentially binding site for GAL4. So now the transcription factor GAL4 can recognize this piece of DNA and bind to it. By binding to it, it can activate gene expression. But because this is uniform and because this is piece of DNA is encoded genetically, so every nucleus or every cell is expressing it, this is essentially a way to give the same amount of strength to all the cells at the same level. And the trick of introducing this by the father is just because if you put any gene in ma through the males, because the early stage of development are driven maternally, you get no expression, right? The zygotic genome or any paternal contribution will only be expressed at the maternal to zygotic transition. By doing this, we essentially let the early stage of development be driven all by the maternal product and only see psychotic product later on. And Eric is going to explain you how that idea was actually seminal to find uh, all the genes that control early embryonic development, which he actually discovered himself. Right, so these cells divide about... 25 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes before any endogenous cells will divide. And it takes about 10, 15, 15 minutes realistically for, from string expression to cell division. So at the time at which these cells are dividing, nobody's expressing string yet. If you wait 10, 15 minutes, you might start getting interference. But if you do it at the stage at which we did it, essentially there's no endogenous string because it's not being expressed yet. So string is degraded at the maternal to zygotic transition. There's nothing left. And then you re-express it in the cells that you want to divide. That is pro very accurately programmed. It only happens a few minutes before mitosis. So we are driving the, this mitosis sufficiently early that you don't run. So if I were to, if I, could, if I gave you a timeline, you have, uh, the, the maternal to zygotic transition or MBT, you have um, cellularization about 50 minutes, and that's where our UAS string gets expressed. And then uh, the cells will, in this experiment, the cells, cell division will happen here. So this will be probably about 60 to 65 minutes. If I show you what will happen endogenously, maybe I'll. I don't sure yet. Can I raise this? Did everybody write down the information about the trips? Well, I'll, I'll try to squeeze it here. I just, maybe somebody wants to go back and get. So if I were, we were to look again, you'll have the MBT, and then you'll have cellularization about 50 minutes. And then the earliest mitotic domain would be maybe at about 75 to 80 minutes, but we'll only start express string about 60 to 65. So what you can see is that as this cell divide is the earliest that you ever see string expression. So this divide early enough that you don't have to worry about the endogenous contribution. So, Yes, no. So this, uh, this is a maternal specific promoter. Maternal tubulate promoter is only expressed in the mother and the germline. The protein will stick around for a while, and this fly will not survive. That, uh, that program of gene expression may sound morphogenically significantly, I believe, that the embryo will not survive. The, uh, but uh, but you, don't need the, you don't need to get adults to do the experiment, right? Because you just pick up the right female, you cross them to the right male, you do your experiment, and you're done, right? So, but 
but the, yeah, you just use a maternal promoter. You don't need the sophisticated inducible way to do this type of experiment. Okay, I'm afraid. So this is the way we 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 drive expression, and what you what you will see. And this is also not playing, but. But what, what, you, what you will see if you look at this, or when you quantify these movies, is that uh, if you look in individual cells, then you have, uh, you can get traces like this. And this, so this is about the time from anaphase of cycle 13. So you can sort of see the timing about 45 to 50 minutes, which is about the end of cellularization. The string proteins start accumulating, and you can see it go up and then cell enter mitosis. And you can do this sort of exercise for a lot of cells. And what we, do, what we did was just calling these the time between when string is expressed and cell division. And you do this for a lot of cells. And you, me you measure this rate of activation of string, and you measure the time it takes. And then you can really see that the cells are, seems to be sensitive to, to string activation rate. And here, now we wanted to go from this to trying to maybe say something a little more of how you make this transformation accurate. So the way that we thought about this, or the, the, at least to start, was that maybe it was convenient to kind of borrow some uh, pages from books of quantitative biology or control theory, starting maybe about input-output relationship, right? So you have a signal that is going up linearly. What kind of computation is the cell doing to make this decision? And that the, is the computation in any way optimal to assure some precision? And um, so the first thing we asked is like, what kind of transformation is the cell doing? Is it maybe just a linear transformation or just linear with saturation? Or you have some abrupt or what is called a switch? Is the cell just sitting there and then there is some magic threshold at which it, it commits to divide? Maybe not surprising, we have talked about the need of making transition very switch-like and rapid, and what that will give to the, the advantage that those will give to the cell. Also, James has talked about bistability as a feature that will also give this kind of sharpness and, um, and insensitivity to noise, at least at the, at the transition, after the transition has been made. And uh, in fact, we found that this decision is very switch-like, so the way that this is usually quantified is using a yield coefficient. Essentially, this number is a number such that the highest it is. And actually, I've done an equation here for it. So the highest is what you can convince yourself very easily is that the highest design is the more rapid this is. This is actually with n equal 1. And you see the growing up is very slow. But if you have an n much larger than 1, then you get something that's a lot more abrupt. And in this case, we have a n of 7, which is rather sharp. A different way to think about this is that you could see how much string do I need so that I have a probability of dividing of about 10%, and how much of that I need to have a probability of dividing of about 90%. And that's only about twofold. So a change of twofold in the concentration of this enzyme makes you to have a very little probability of being in mitosis to high probability. But such a, if you have such a rapid response, you might think that, um, and again, a lot of people have touched on this, you might have sensitivity to noise. Because if there is a little fluctuation that brings you right above that level, then you will just go. Because uh, you are trying to commit very quickly. So, so is there a way in which embryonic development optimizes this need to be fast and commit to cell transition rapidly, and uh, also do it with some precision? And again, we were thinking about this from a point of view of signal processing. And the first thing that we thought is that uh, if you read any engineering book about control and signal processing, what usually they tell you is that there is a trade-off between sensitivity and accuracy. So if you have a signal that is very noisy and you're trying to make a decision based on it, it's very difficult. One way that you can improve that signal, and this is also is that you could not respond to its instantaneous value, but you could have some built-in system that is sort of responding to, to, to the integral of this. And actually, if you take this curve and you do its integral, you end up with something like this. This is a lot smoother than this, so you won't have the problem that if the treasure threshold was by mistake here, 
you land there, exit, enter again, maybe you may even exit again, and so you don't really get confused around here. But this temporal integration will make your decision very reliable. The problem is that if you have a very rapid change, as you have it here, it's very difficult to be sure that there was a rapid change there. So by integrating, you can improve precision, but you sort of become slow. So you can be fast and, and inaccurate, or can, you can be slow and accurate. And of course, there is a whole range of solution in between, and there is a trade-off. And we, what I'll show you is that we think that the cell do something in between that we will speculate could be a way to, to, to improve precision. Mm -hmm. So they will enter mitosis, and we really have not followed that after. But what will happen is, right, so, so we are only looking at the first cell side. We are only looking at the response of, of this ramping up because this is what happens endogenously and physiologically. So we only look at 14 cell cycle. We don't look at what happens later. The level supposedly may get degraded once they exit mitosis, but then they accumulate very fast again if you do it through the Gulf 4 UAS. But this is not what we are, we are following. Okay, so... So the, what we did was to mine our data and try to ask it, okay, so what is the cell really computing to make this decision? Can we extract the kind of signal processing that cells do from data? So what we did the first was ask, that, would an instantaneous model work, a model in which there is really an R threshold, the cell accumulates string to that level and they divide? If that was the case, you would think that independently of how quickly you accumulate string, you will always divide at the same level. So a way to plot this or independently of what this lag in time is, actually you'll always divide at the same level. So if I plot the amount of string versus delta T, I should get a flat line because all the cells are dividing at the same time. Another possibility is that they are integrating. If they were integrating, then it should be the integral that should be constant. And if you plot the data, you find that neither one works. So they are neither integrating, not taking an instantaneous measurement. This is probably not surprising, but again, cells that activate take a little longer to divide. They seem to do it with a little bit less string. Cells that take long, and but the integral is still much higher. So then what we said was like, okay, if that's not explaining it, let's try a simple function that might explain it. And what we thought is like an instantaneous model means that you are integrating over a time scale of zero. An integral model, you are essentially, you have infinite memory. Maybe what the cell does, it's integrating, but over just a short period of time. So you can easily write that as a, say, you may you have your string dynamics as a function of time. You deconvolve that with an exponential kernel with a given time scale, and you ask, what kind of memory does the cell need to have to explain the decision? And we got a time scale that is about two minutes, which is, uh, which is may seem fast, but it's not that much faster than the time scale we are interested in. So we think that the cell is trying a compromise between still, they, it wants to respond on a time scale of about 10, 15 minutes. But so it's, um, in doing so, maybe you don't want a memory of 10, 15 minutes because that's equivalent to just doing an integral and you run back into the same problem of being slow, but they still, still don't integrate over seconds on which, um, which maybe noise will be too relevant. Really, if you want to be skeptical and the experiment that we don't have, but I think we should do here, that will be crucial is to measure what is the time scale of the fluctuation of noise. Because if the, if the fluctuation of noise was on time scale of 30 seconds, the co time correlation time of noise fluctuation was of order of one minute, this system will be perfect, will filter out the noise and still give you speed. If the fluctuation correlation were of order of five, 10 minutes, this will really not help. And we haven't done that experiment yet, and, but I think we really should too. Was there a question? Okay. So now, how do you build a biochemical signal, a biochemical circuit that integrates signal over time? And um, it turned out that the solution is rather simple. And it's actually kind of obvious in a way. But so 
what is happening is that you have an enzyme CDK1 that could either be in an active state or an inactive state, and the transition between these two states is driven by these two enzymes. And uh, what is happening is that V1 is constant and string is going up. Now, if you think about how much of CDK1 will be active at any given time, that is not necessarily going to follow instantaneously how much string and V1 you have, because these are enzymatic reactions that take time. So there is a built-in time scale into this, which is the inverse of the enzymatic activity or the rate at which these enzymes are operating. And uh, so that time scale could give you the integration. And uh, because then how much string you need for division is kind of set up by how much we want you have, this sort of make a prediction that I should, if I can do an experiment in which I can change with one level, I should be able to change uh, uh, for how long they integrate. And so this we were successful in doing, and we did a very simple experiment of looking in a V1 heterozygotes. And what we found was that um, if you do an experiment in V1 heterozygotes and you ask for how long they integrate, well, you will expect, because the integration is the inverse of V1 concentration, you will expect this integration to get longer. And uh, this is sort of what we see. A two minutes integration doesn't fit the data anymore. But if we go up to about five to six minutes, now we have a longer integration. We could overexpress V1 a little bit. And these data are a lot less convincing because at some point it's almost saturated. So it's very hard to know. But at least, you know, there seems to be a trend. This model, actually, by having a kinase phosphate cycle that is operating out of equilibrium, also gives you some switch-like response. Not a very high one, but is uh, sufficient maybe to explain some data we had about the relationship between CDC25 level and CDK1 activity. So what we speculated in this paper, and I agree that it would be great to show that the integration time is the relevant one, one, but what we speculate is that if you control a cell decision, by having a kinase phosphatase cycle, what you get automatically, you can get an, a switch, or at least a moderate switch, but you also get an ability to reach a compromise between speed and accuracy. And this is what I tried to depict here. So what I did here, this is the same signal I showed you before, but in red now, instead of showing the integration as I did before, I'm showing you the integral of this activity with a time scale of about two minutes. And, uh, or, you know, at some short-term integration. And what you see here is that this is a compromise in the sense that this curve is much smoother, but it's still able to sort of follow or just follow with little delays and decrease, and decrease in slopeness. It's very, it's pretty much able to follow rapid changes in activity. So this could be a compromise. You filter out noise, but you still have some rapidity in, in response. And it will be very interesting to see if these kind of strategies are actually used over and over again as a mechanism to achieve precision and filter out noise. OK. OK. Yeah. Uh, yeah OK. Go ahead. Right, so, so this is what, I mean, this is actually, and we are not the first one to propose this idea. We are probably, I'm not, I'm not sure if, even if we are the first one that is experiment. Probably in development, we are among the first one who have tried to quantify and show some evidence that this is actually the way that they do it in a context that has to do with time. But there's a lot of theoretical work. In fact, Boris Schreiman, who is uh, speaking next week, is, uh, he did a lot, he, he had a theoretical paper in which all these ideas that I sketched were very nicely explained and the compromise between speed and accuracy was, and this was actually in part what inspired us in doing this work. So yes, this is, this is a lot of work in engineering and control theory and even work done by people who were thinking exactly about this type of circuit before. So I'm sorry if I gave the impression that we invented this, probably not referencing all the relevant work done before. But this was our attempt at figuring it out, the possible role of this kind of mechanism for timing the cell cycle in development. Yeah. Uh, 
Y yo se la cuesta. Right, so we think you integrate, you filter out the noise, but you don't integrate over the whole history. You integrate with a two minutes exponential kernel. What that is essentially doing, if you want, is that you are only integrated over about a few minutes. So, so you are, you, right, so it's not that, it's an averaging, but you're only averaging over what happened in a few minutes so that you don't need to keep all this memory of past events that are gonna preclude you from being able to respond very quickly to what if things change very quickly. And so we think that this is a compromise, and you can make some of these arguments a lot more rigorous mathematically, and some theories are doing it, but um, we just want it to be as simple as possible in our thinking, because in any case, we, were, we are very limited, maybe now we can improve in how well we can measure these things. So we, did, we couldn't be too sophisticated in our theory because we couldn't be able to distinguish sophisticated method with the data that we could generate. Okay, so uh, this took a little longer than I wanted, but so this is our answer to the second problem, right? How do you go from turning on string to making a decision that we think is accurate and fast? But now we still don't know why cells divide so accurately because we don't know it's, how do they know so accurately when to turn on string transcription. And this is a much harder problem, and we are still uh, working on it. I think it's an exciting one. The first cue from this came from, again, Bruce Edgar. Just uh, if you do fly cell cycle, you can escape him. And, uh, and uh, what Bruce showed was that uh, if you mutate the patterning genes, these are the same genes that uh, Thomas and also James were talking about. These are genes that tell, sp give special information to the embryo. These, are, these genes somehow inform the cells of where and when to divide. I, I think what this really shows is that it informs cells where to divide. And then I'll, now I'll go over the work that Amir, who was a former graduate student of Eric and collaborated also with me, did to try to figure out if they also encode time. But what the Bruce showed here was, this is mitotic domain two and would be one of the major projects of my talk now. If you look at this mitotic domain two and you look in a mutant for a, one of these genes that is expressing all in a certain region of the embryo called gap gene, and you mutate that gene, then mitotic domain two doesn't, is not there anymore. These cells are not programmed to divide anymore. Similarly, another transcription factor that specified the messenger, and Eric will talk about this. These cells do divide, but if you don't have twist, they don't divide. And what you are looking at here, it's a um, technique called in situ for string and RNA. So string is not expressed in mitotic domain two. If you have a button end null, it's not expressed in what is mitotic domain 10 if you don't have twist. So this seems great. The pattern in gene controls string, but there is a problem with this type of experiment. Is that you, we really don't know if you just do this mutation, if this factor are really what encodes time, because you know that they are required. But once you get them off, these cells are not dividing anymore, so you don't know if uh, what is timing them. You just know that this factor is needed for them to be expressed. But it could be possible that this factor just needs to be there, and then there's another cue that is giving you time. So what we decided to do, and we thought was better, is that anything that is a limiting regulator of any process, if you change the rate at which it accumulates or gets degraded, if you change its rate, you should be able to see a shift in time. So the way that it's easy to do this genetically is that you look in an heterozygote. So now instead of having got rid of a gene, we have just made it half. So, so you don't have as much of a gene product as you want, you have half. This should either slow down or accelerate processes if that's a rate limiting regulator. If it is not, nothing should change. And so the first experiment Amir did was taking the bottleneck gene that I just showed you, and he compared. So I told you that it's re it was required to divide the mitotic domain two. These are the blue cells here. So now what you will predict, and it actually also had a way to give him more button head, and I don't, I'm not gonna tell you the genetics is a bit complicated, but believe me that he could do this. And what he noticed is that if you have only one copy, a lot of cell in mitotic domain one start dividing, and mitotic domain two follows. But if you have, uh, four copy of bottleneck, then mitotic domain two divides first, and then mitotic domain one follow. 
you can quantify this, but it could show that by changing the dosage of this gene, it could shift the time at which cells divide. So that's when a wild type will divide. If you give it a little less, it's later. If you give a little more, it's earlier. So these genes seem to be a really limiting activator. So then what Amir decided to do, and that's a picture of him, is now graduated and move on a postdoc. And uh, Eric was sitting in the audience. What Amir decided to do was to do a genome-wide screen. He was going to look for all the genes in the genome that will do this, that they will act as rate limiting activator. But he wanted to do it in a way in which you only change dosage. A lot of this experiment that be done, obviously, in which you take out completely the activity of a gene. As I told you, and I hope I've convinced you, that is not going to tell us about time. We needed this more sophisticated and precise quantitative measure, which is exactly what Amir developed. And so here he used a great trick. Flies are great genetic organism, and you'll hear more about that. But the people have engineered flies in which, let's say this is a fly chromosome, so it's a large structure. You can essentially delete a big piece of it, sometimes even up to 1%. And the fly is able to live with this genetic deletion because he has a a functional copy of that gene on another chromosome. So the fly essentially can survive uh, as, uh, by only having one copy of even like a lot of genes, like hundreds, which is remarkable. And it's a remarkable genetic trick because now we don't need to scan every single gene. We could use this deficiency to scan regions of the genome that are larger. And then once we find interesting regions, we can go, go in and look for the genes. And so what Amir decided to do to get a lot of embryos, he will actually not use light imaging. Now he will fi fix embryo and use the phosphohistone uh, reagent I introduced before, something that marks specifically mitotic cells. And what he will do, he will fix embryo, and then he will count how many cells are in mitosis, in mitotic domain one and two, and will do that over time. And this is not projecting well, but he had a proxy a morphological process pro proxy that allowed him to estimate time very accurately. So he could do this over time, and essentially he got a map. This is how many cells in mitotic domain or one or two divide as a function of time. And now he goes, he builds a very nice map for wild type, and then he goes to the deficiency. And what you expect to find are three classes, either deficiencies that don't change time, this should be most of them, hopefully. Hopefully, there will only be fewer limiting regulators so that the problem is simple and we can actually treat it and solve it. And I'll show you the evidence that this seems to be the case, thankfully. Another possibility is that a deficiency actually does advance or delay timing so that either the time they divide a little later or a little rarely. If you want, this could be a rate limiting activator or a rate limiting repressor. There's another thing, though, that is interesting here is that the slope of this line is the same. What that means is that the time it takes for cell in one domain, all the cell in one domain to divide is the same. You are just making them divide a few minutes earlier or a few minutes later. So you have shift time, but you have not changed the overall rate at which they enter mitosis. There is a third possibility, of course, in which they start dividing at about the right time, but then they either pro the, the mitotic domain progress slower or faster. So what Amir did was he covered about 85% of the genome. So it's not full coverage, but it was still quite impressive because it required him to screen more than 200 deficiency. And you have to count many embryos for each deficiency. So this was a lot of work, but I think it paid off because he did get it, especially for mitotic domain 2. It didn't work quite as well for mitotic domain 1, or mitotic domain 1 only as a one regulator, it's hard to believe. But uh, for mitotic domain two, we got a lot of it. And, um, and so now what we can do, of course, is like we have essentially what we have done now, we know that there's a piece of DNA somewhere on a given chromosome that seems to be, be acting as rail limiting, but that doesn't tell us the gene. So what Amir did for the gene, for finding the gene, he went on into. So, no, this is different deficient. So this is a different, what this is, is a different um, genetic manipulation. So this line, okay, so what, what it does, it fixes a lot of embryo, and then it counts. And this is telling you, this is a map, and it's extrapolated. So these are not the raw data. I'll show you some raw data in a second. This is just something in which you 
get a, because they will look too clouded. But it, it, let's say, stains 30 embryo of a certain genotype, and then it counts how many cells divide as a function of time and build this map. And then every one of these lines is lacking. Remember, I told you that the, we could delete a piece of chromosome. So this one will me, make, maybe miss a piece of chromosome somewhere on chromosome 2. At the beginning, this will miss a piece on the end of chromosome 2. So this is sort of like the way that you could think of this is walking through the genome and delete piece by piece, try to find which piece will give you a shift in this map. The gray stuff, in the gray stuff are all the deficiencies, sorry. The gray stuff are all the deficiencies that they did not do anything. So the gray majority, like about 90 something percent of the deficiency don't do anything, which is great, which means there is only few specific genes. Not that every time you delete any gene, you mess up with the mitotic program. That would mean that we will never figure it out what it is. So this is actually a great thing that Eric will probably also talk about when he's going to talk about genetics, which is uh, the importance of having processes in which only few genes are really important for something, because then you can really get specificity and you can understand what is happening. So then what, to find the gene, what Amir decided to do was to zoom in a region and look at which genes were expressed in that region. And this is what you get. You get this big list. This really looks overwhelming. But because we work with flies and we can stand off the shoulder of so many good people that have done genetics and a lot of other work, you can just guess. And the way you guess, you look, is there some transcription factor that we know that is important in patterning the embryo and is expressed specifically in this region? And for each one of these deficiencies, you can find such a gene. So in this party, for this particular deficiency, he looked and he found that there is a gene called empty spiracle. And this gene is expressed as subtly in mitotic domain too. And then what you do, you get a mutant from the mutant collection or from, you know, you go into Eric Stocks and you find the mutant for the gene. And you see if repeating the experiment rather than with the deficiency, but with the mutant gives you the exact same phenotype. Would you still see a delay in the time when cell divide? And it could show that all these deficiencies were recapitulated by single mutants. So, it, so now he has found the genes. This is actually how the raw data looks like, and this is the name of the genes for the aficionados. I already showed you button head, so we already had one activator for domain two, and now I show you two other, empty spiracle and CNIRPS. What will happen in here is that the, the black curve is the wild type curve, so this is typically how cells will divide. But now if you, and this is what is plotting here, is doing something a little different. It's plotting mitotic domain two versus mitotic domain one. And what happens is that if you have a, a little bit less empty spiracle, what will happen is that cell in mitotic domain one now start dividing a little earlier with respect to cell in mitotic domain two so that the curve is shift up. And you see, and again, as I mentioned, you, you get the same curve for the deficiency that you get for the mutant. So this is really the gene in that region. You get the same thing for CNIRPS. There is activator. There is also repressors. And um, so what, what you saw is that there were uh, three genes that shift this curve down. What was interesting was, although that all these genes, they all belong to the class that I told you before in which you shift the curve, but you don't change the slope. So somehow, just changing the dosage was not sufficient to make the cell, the overall rate be slow, where you just program the cells five, to divide five minutes later or five minutes earlier. However, if he did a double perturbation, if he muta mutated, let's say, if he got rid of two repressors or two activators, then he starts seeing some condition in which the slope became statistically, statist in a statistically significant manner, either smaller or larger. So it does look that, I don't know, Maybe it's an abuse term, but a way you could state this is that the system is robust. If you just go and break a single activator a little bit, it will still, you still get a very precise or a group of cells that divide with its own temporal precision. But if you start messing with two, um, maybe then also it takes somewhat longer. Anyway, this is the data. What it really means, we, are, we don't know yet. But so now what we know, we know that there is certain genes that are limiting, but we still don't understand how time is encoded so precisely. And I don't have an answer yet, but the way then 
my student Patrick, who is here, although he's not here right now, and, um, and I have been thinking about this, building on, of course, already on a lot of discussion that I've had over the years with both Amir and Eric about this. And it's not, I mean, it's not that of original an idea. It's just let's start this transcription factor and see what they do. And I'll show you movies for two of them. I'll show you some quantification. And I'll stop there because we haven't done enough analysis to have anything actually intelligent to say. But hopefully I will next time. And this should play because I know that I just put them in. So this is a botanet, one of the major activators. And I'll play this again. So what you will see is that when this movie starts, you hardly see any fluorescence in, in yellow. And these are the these are eastern markers so that you can follow the nuclei. And then as time progresses, you'll see GFP appear in a stripe, and then most of the cell in this area will undergo mitosis. And as they undergo mitosis, the nuclear envelope breaks, and so the signal disperses. And that's actually a great way to see when they enter mitosis. This is instead what happens for a repressor. It's called sloppy pair one. Now the mitotic domain is going to be around here. And I hope you, what you'll be able to see is that when we start the movie, sloppy pair is expressed in most of the cells in domain two and will kind of specifically disappear only from the cells that are programmed to be mitotic domain two. So disappears here, and these are the cells that will divide. So this is about where mitotic domain two is, and these are the cells that have lost expression. And again, we don't know how accurate, if this is a one-to-one -one mapping, or how accurate this is. This is all very preliminary. But what we do have, and it's working, uh, is that we have uh, algorithms to very simple, uh, or, I mean, we can use all our algorithm to quite simply segment and track those cells. And so this is the kind of dynamics we see. Bottom head starts very low. And this is what happens if you look in a region when there is no expression. So this could serve our zeros for expression or the noise level, background level. Bottom head goes up with time and sloppy pair goes down. And now what the question we want to ask is, how does a cell sense these changes in concentration to make an accurate decision to time and uh, you know, are there accurate switches? Are they actually integrated, integrated, doing similar kind of integration? Or is, is there enough dynamical range into this that this decision could be accurate without needing specialized mechanism? So this is most of what I have of our time to understand how mitosis are timed and how one could generate a precise temporal program for gene expression. And the conclusion, I guess, for this part are that it looks like that the same transcription factor that control the spatial pattern or encode this, the spatial information in the embryo somehow also encode the temporal pattern of mitosis. So you could think of maybe the mitotic program as being part of the differentiation program as the, having these clocks that are built in to ensure that the cells never run into problem of dividing and doing morphogenesis at the same time. And uh, there is both activator and repressors, and we can measure their dynamics. And hopefully, next time uh, I give a talk, you will be able to hear something more intelligent about it. And um, so Eric and Amir, so all the work that I have presented, except for the last part, that is now the work of my graduate student, Patrick, who most of you have met, was done in collaboration with Eric, the first part or now cells go from activated string to mitosis was actually my first postdoc project when I was with Eric. And then the big screen and probably the, I would say the biggest breakthrough we have so far about this problem of timing was really done by a great graduate student, Amir, who is now postdoc in Columbia. That's it.